British music producer Paul Epworth has worked with some enormous names, including Adele, U2, Coldplay and Paul McCartney. But his new studio, The Church, has a creative history all of its own. Although formerly a house of worship, the building has at various stages been owned by the makers of children's TV shows, as well as Dave Stewart of The Eurythmics and singer-songwriter David Gray. Over the years, it has also welcomed Bob Dylan, Radiohead and Depeche Mode. We take a look around and talk to Paul about his vision for the newly renovated studios. We're here for Sound on Sound at the Church Studios in North London with uh, Mr. Paul Epworth. Who... Hi. Hi. Hi, Hi Paul. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Uh, yeah, good, thanks. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Um, so, Paul, you've uh, got quite a list of credits to your name, and you know, you've know you got a Brit Award, uh, five Grammys, an Oscar, <laughs> and uh, your latest endeavour is uh, this place, the church. So, do you want to tell us a bit about the history of it and how you came to be involved with, with the place? Well, um, I'd set out looking for studio and the uh, and it, my search wasn't quite as fruitful initially as I hoped it was going to be. Um, and I went through several different spaces to you know try and find somewhere that obviously I could make noise late, late at night. Eventually sort of had a call from David Gray saying he was looking to pass this place on. And initially I didn't, I just, I thought there's no way that I'm going to be able to make this place work. And um, then I kind of, after a few months of kind of gradually sort of trying to get my head around the idea, I sort of called him up and said, are you, are you still looking to, are you still looking to, for someone else to take that on? He said, I'm about to sell it. And, uh, and I said, don't do it. <laughs> I'll, uh, I think I might have a solution. And um, and we 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 worked it out, and this was sort of this was about May May last year, and I think we finally sort of we finally got it all together by October, and then moved in in January, and uh, and then had sort of set about trying to sort of renovate the place a bit. And so, in terms of the renovations, then what what have you done to the place? Because this room, I, it doesn't seem like it's changed an enormous amount. But no, I mean, we we, tell us about we put we put we. Put a huge desk in the well, live room. That. I mean, that's, that's the most striking feature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it wouldn't fit in. The, it wouldn't fit in the control room. Um, there was obviously the SSL room downstairs, which was um, built in sort of 1986, I think. Mm. And um, and then there was a little studio out the back, which was a more of like a, a sort of someone. It was originally a lounge that someone had set up a studio in. And I sort of began to try and work out how we could make these this room and and both the rooms downstairs into sort of good, you know, like uh, sort of commercially viable uh, studios. Mm. And um, one thing that we discovered in when we were doing our sort of, sort of acoustic tests was that the, it's clear this room up here hadn't been used very much when the room downstairs was in use. So this is Studio One that we're this in at the is, moment? This is Studio One and Studio Two is the SSL room. And it was clear there was a, the, the isolation between the two rooms wasn't maybe as, 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 as uh, as, as, as complex as it needed to be to deal with the speakers we were intended to put in downstairs. Mm. So we had to sort of start from scratch, which involved basically raising the, uh, the existing SSL room to the ground <laughs> and rebuilding it on, you know, with, you know, 140 decibels of isolation. So um, that was a nine month job. Wow, and um, <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty spectacular room now. Yeah, it's, good, it's a good space to work in. So what was the, um, was it just the isolation that was the, the thing you wanted to change about it or was, were there other um, concerns about the design? I mean, uh, specifically, um, the major criteria was we wanted to, I wanted to put in some speakers that I, I liked working on and weren't mm. taxing on the ears over long periods of time, um, had, were capable of dealing with the, the, sort of the base of modern music. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and so we thought we'd initially do this by taking out one front wall. And uh, after a while, it became clear that wasn't it wasn't going to be that easy. Mm. And also, we, you know, these, you know, obviously the, the bass transmission between the room downstairs and this room was there was a lot more, um, you know, communication between the two rooms than we'd hoped. Mm. So obviously, we needed to isolate the isolate the room downstairs because we we didn't want to have to change this room at all because it felt you know it's such a a character space that you know we didn't really want to touch it. 
So obviously the work we, we, we had to do downstairs, we, we relied on their kind of expertise of, of uh, uh, WSDG mm -hmm. um, to, to, to design the room. I'd, I'd used a room of theirs in, in New York, which I've, I've, I, I really enjoyed working in. I felt like the main monitoring was really good. So we basically set out to try and sort of recreate that here in the hope that it was going to work for us, but it was also going to work for other people. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, nine months later. <laughs> so then, so this room itself, we're in Studio One, and it's, I mean, it's an amazing <clears throat> space. But one thing that's really striking as you come in is that there's no control room. Yeah. So is that one, is that sort of your personal preference or what's the reasoning for that? Well, I, I, the funny thing is actually I, I, do, I do like working in open plan spaces because I feel like you're, you're much more connected with the, the people you're working with. Um, there's a sort of healthy, um, healthy communication and you, I think you kind of get a much better understanding of the creative dynamics that are going on in the room with a, with a group of musicians and, uh, and so that from, that from that perspective I think I've always enjoyed working in spaces where you, there isn't glass and, and you know you do have to monitor on headphones when you're recording. Um, you, have to, you have to make compromises like test recording something before you put someone in for a pass or you're just going for a pass and just hope, you know, and, and hope for the best. Right. Um, so it does require certain compromises. Mm. Um, but the, the, you know, the, the, other, the other compromise was the fact that I knew putting a desk like this into, into the studio, it, it, it puts it in a slightly different, um, a slightly different bracket in terms of the, the, the specifications that people look for. Mm. Um, so we, you know, I'd actually, I'd actually already bought this desk, desk to put in somewhere else, and uh, it was never going to fit in that control room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, it's a bit of a beast. So, what, do you want to tell us about the desk then? What, what exactly is it, and how did it come to be? In in 1976, EMI commissioned. Uh, Neve to make them a uh, five custom boards. Um, all the modules are 1091s. Um, the EQ, EQ mic amp modules are 1091s, which um, are like uh, basically a 1073 with slightly different um, EQ characteristics. There were five of these desks desks built, um, and and this is actually comprises two of them. Um, one was in Abbey Road. One half of it was in Abbey Road um, in Studio Three. So I think the f f one of the first recordings it did, I'm told, was Wish You Were Here. Right. And the other half was in a studio called Pathé Marconi in Paris. And, um, and I'm aware that this half of the board did Some Girls by the Rolling Stones. Hmm. So, um, you know, I think uh, it's, you can definitely hear a bit of the character of it on, something, on, a, on, a, re on a record like Miss You. Um, and the sort of, you know, the, the depth of the, the, these boards, you can get out of these boards. They have a quite a specific character to them, um, which I think, you know, in terms of having the, this board with this sort of the, the openness that you get from it in a space like this, I think um, there's, um, you know, we, it's a it's a pretty special combination. And if you're willing to accept the compromises that that, that having the board in the same room provides, um, the, you know, the monitoring sounds good in here as well. So you get a pretty good idea what you're doing. Um, so do you find yourself mixing on this desk, or are you? Doing that all on the SSL downstairs? Um, no, we, it, it, it really depends. I mean, we quite often will get something up to a certain stage in here. Mm -hmm. Some of the some of the U2 mixes that were essentially board mixes from this room were tweaked slightly and went on the album. Mm -hmm. So, so conversely, some of the tracks, some, you know, you work on something up here, take it down to the writing room, and finish it off down there, or or into the SSL. But in terms of the, you know, we've had WSDG have have tuned and, and, and accurately set the monitoring up in here as well. So even though we haven't, we haven't um, essentially made any acoustic changes apart from obviously a, you know, a bit of absorption to try and sort of tailor the room down, we've, we've, we've done everything we can to try and make sure mm. so you can actually get a good idea of what you're listening to here. Yeah. Um, and then taking that we've got you know, the, the writing room and, and the SSL room obviously being have built to quite exact specifications. Mm. So we, we think they're some of the most accurate control rooms in the country. So if we just, uh, if we talk about <clears throat> the setup that's in this room, then, yeah. 
to start with. I mean, it's set up now for a session. Yeah. So do you want to just talk us through what you've got going on in terms of um, how you like things set up in this room and why you've decided to go for... We've, we've, we've set the drums up over there in the centre so you've got plenty of room to be able to get late, you know, delay mics back from the, from the kit. We've got a couple of ambience here. Um, and, um, you know, occasionally we use wide mics in the corners. But the, uh, the, the main thing is we, where the drums are set up, we can either baffle them down so you get a tighter kit sound or we can open it up. We've obviously got the curtains here that you can draw across mm. that David, put, David Gray put in. And so if you suddenly need a kind of tighter drum sound, you can pull the curtains across and baffle the top of the, you know, top of the screens in. We've got a sort of piano world over there, which is, you know, just kind of, you know, it's obviously nice to be able to get the piano projecting into the room. And so it makes, it makes sense, for obviously, uh, to, for, to do it that way around so there's eye contact from the musicians if they want to playing together. Um, but we've actually set up quite a nice little sort of synthesizer world over here now, where we, so we can, it's pretty fast if you want to kind of over, overdub stuff mm. of people playing together. And there are some pretty interesting pieces in, in synth world. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's, a few, there's a few nice little bits and pieces. Um, but the, one, of the, one of the major beneficial things is, of course, you can have, you can, you, can, uh, you know, when you're recording, you can have eye contact yourself as an engineer or producer with the musicians mm -hmm. as well, which means that you can very quickly get in, get involved in in guiding performances or encouraging people to repeat parts or mm -hmm. you know sort of standing around waving your hands frantically to try and sort of get them to uh, to to guide them to do the right thing or what you perceive as the right thing. Um, but um, it's you know it's a, one of the major things I think having is, is it's really wonderful having daylight, which I think keeps a level of sanity when you're doing long hours. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, in terms of gear, then I guess are there are there any things, any favourite toys or anything that you have at the moment? Are there things you're sort of oh loads of loads of stuff. The uh, you know one, one thing we tried to do here is because there's so much we do in the digital domain. Um, so. Quite often, you, you, as soon as you, as soon as you go, you go into Pro Tools, you kind of, you, you're not, you're not committed. But it's nice to be able to make sure you get sounds with character. Um, into, you know, we've got clasp set up here, so you can actually record via tape. Mm -hmm. um, but it means you're not, you're not forced to then have to dump everything in and hope you can synchronise it and all the, you know, all the, all the sort of, the complications that that provides. So t clasp makes things very easy to. To do and obviously what, what you know people talk about doing drums to tape and guitars to tape but the one thing that's underrated is doing synthesizers to tape really? and that does yeah it does really add sort of color and character to the sound and you know and um you know quite often it do, you know d you know a lot of the sort of classic synthesizer sounds were obviously recorded recorded to tape originally mm. so kind of you know that there's there's that sort of factor as well but we've we've, we've tried to kind of get a good balance of of you know of modern gear, you know, class A stuff, and a, and, a, and a healthy collection of valve gear, which means you can kind, you know, that depending on whether you want to go for a, a sort of a sort of class A more seventies kind of sound, or sort of an earlier sixties or valvey sixties sound, <clears throat> or or if you want to go straight digital, you can do it, you know. So you got, I think that's, I, I look to try and take things from different eras, and you know, mm -hmm. to, to try and get different characters, and sometimes kind of co combining these things. You get something new, um, and I think that's um, you know. I, mean, I guess every, every you know every engineer, engineer producer knows that they can they can change the effect of something by switching a mic amp or switching a microphone. But I think that's you know that we've tried to sort of go to the extreme here because of the, and cater for versatile to, to versatile tastes mm. and different kinds of music as well. So hopefully we've done it. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we talk a bit more specifically about some of your sort of favourite bits of gear? So that we yeah. sort of, I mean, maybe this thing over here or whatever it might oh, the, be. Oh, the so. computer rhythm, yeah. That's yeah. sort of the first, the first programmable drum machine, which is um, I was always curious. I was always curious how you know that to have something which was very easy, to, easy to put patterns into, and um, it's a bit of a collector's item. Um, you used to get punch cards for it. You could actually put the put the rhythms in vibe just dropping a punch card through. But sadly, the, the, this one didn't come with the punch cards, and I, I think they're very hard to replicate. But 
think it's easy enough to put a pattern in if you want it. And uh, I mean, just the, just the ease of being able to go, well, look, you know, here's a, here's a, here's a rhythm. You can do it in a matter of seconds and, mm. and, and, and synchronise it to the computer. So the quicker the creative process is, the, the easier it is to get your ideas across, I mm. think. Um, I love the old uh, v, got a VCS Putney, um, EMS Putney, which is a, a bit of a favourite for, um, for putting everything through. For a bit of kind of uh, a bit, of, a bit of grit and dirt to it, and uh, it's uh, I think you sort of it, we tend to use it as an orc send on everything. Right. Um, but we've got um, we've, we've got a few old EMI bits. We've got like some of the old EMI mastering chain here. Um, the uh, sort of uh, EMI a couple of EMI compressors and filters, and uh, and just managed to acquire one of the original Zener limiters. Which is uh, an absolutely amazing acquisition for uh, for overheads and stuff. Mm. It sounds beautiful. And then you've also got a whole <coughs> modular synth station going on here as well. Is this a bit of an obsession of yours? No, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a habit that can easily get out of hand. <laughs> uh, as, so this isn't just mine. I, ha I hasten to add, it's right. it's a it's a, some of the other guys here have acquired stuff as well. But the beauty is you can uh, you can you can put it all together and sort of connect it all up, and it all. You know, it all it all it all works in harmony. Um, so then, down in studio <coughs> too, you've got all of your, presumably that's some of your favourite outboard gear. Yeah. Racked up behind yeah. an exposition. Um, are there sort of some bits that your your go tos for certain certain things or? Yeah, I mean, it, it just it just depends. I mean, like you know, obviously you kind of, I think. There are certain things that you that every studio I think needs to have in in its. You know, but in a, especially in a, in a room, in a mix room, mm. there's certain things I think there are specific criteria that everybody wants, aren't they? Like 1176s and maybe these days distressers, mm -hmm. a good valve, you know, vocal compressor, or mm -hmm. you know, we've actually got a a, 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 a reissue uh, Fairchild, which is um, done by a guy called um, Pom. It's called the Pom Child, which is uh, actually really sounds really beautiful. And, um, and and I'm a big fan of all the EAR gear. Mm. Uh, so we've, we've got a lot of that everywhere, including some of the, the microphone amplifiers in here, which I think are some of the best in the business. Mm. Um, but yeah, the uh, you know like, but at the same time we've got RMX16 and H3000, which I you know I think are you know for certain classic sounds, they are uh, they're definitely you know every every studio should have them, and you know maybe not so much these days in, when you when you can do so much in, with plugins. But um, just for, for sort of creative randomness, sometimes you just you need to have these things around. Or for going for you know sounds of specific eras, I think it's quite, it's quite useful to have to, to 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 fall back on. So then, finally, moving on to the the little writing room yeah. there, um, what do you think is the most important element in that to get the creative juices flowing? I guess everything at an arm's length. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Just uh, you can you can work in there on your own, and every you know once you set up, everything is a you know, everything's a, you know an arm's length away. You want a guitar, you can reach you, you can reach the knee, you know there's a little Neve sidecar. You can reach that you, if you want to go and put some drums down. You hit record and go and jump in and do it. Or worst case, we've got you know we've got the iPad remote, so you can go and jump in and actually drop yourself into record. You know, so it means that in terms of actually being able to do stuff without the inhibition of having other people around watching you make a fool of yourself, mm. it's quite you know it's quite useful and. Um, and and I think that that's the way a lot of modern records are made. Can, you know, count, contrary to this space, which is probably how a lot of records are made in in bygone eras. Mm. You know, that's the you know that very much is the focus to be like a modern um, you know modern sort of creative a creative studio um, with there's been acoustically tuned so you can hear. You, you get a good idea of what you're doing, you, you, what you think, you know, you know it's an accurate representation of what you're, the music you're making. There's a few things we've tried to do down there to try and connect the whole, all the rooms together. Like you, we've used a, um, a, um, a Shadow Hills uh, Equinox Summy Mixer. And one of, the re one of the thinking behind that was because if you, if, if you, you can either use it as a stereo out or as a 32 channel Summy Mixer. Mm -hmm. So the idea being that if you wanted to go in there and do a pre-mix, and obviously everything's at Unity Gain, mm -hmm. you can take the same session on Pro Tools or Logic and you can take it next door into the SSL room 
and very quickly make the changes or, or do the kind of, you know, the outboard changes you wanted to do without having to, you know, spend a day per track. You can hopefully move through stuff fairly quickly. So it was kind of, to, in, in terms of trying to make sure that the facilities we have are available to people on limited budgets, we can, <laughs> we can hopefully cater for everybody, you know. That was something that I think I felt was very important to have in, 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 in this day and age when records don't really sell very many. <laughs> so then that's an idea to kind of have the right through from inception to completion. Yeah. Got, yeah, there was, a, there was a, as a holistic sort of, you know, holistic sort of, compl uh, sort of completion between all the way all the studios kind of operated together and... You know, all the rooms are tied into into one another, so that if you're in the writing room and you do want to do a, do a live piano, you could actually use the live room, the SSL room. The SSL room's tied up here, so if, you know, if you wanted to use this space as an echo, you know, echo chamber, mm -hmm. you can do. Or you can use the belfry as a as a, as, a, as an echo chamber if you wanted to. But uh, we 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 can't validate whether or not there'll be pigeons in there. So uh, <laughs> if you're happy with the sound of pigeons on your reverb, you're fine. Um, but it's, uh, you know, we've, we've tried to make sure that we've got every, you know, every sort of criteria covered with each of the three rooms because I like, I like personally, I like working in each of these different environments for depending on what the project is. And, um, and I think the, um, I think that then, obviously, if, if, if I can take care of my needs, hopefully it takes care of lots of other people's criteria as well. So, you know, you want, you want the studio to be busy. Mm. And so you have to try and think about what people's um, sort of creative, creative needs are, which I hopefully we try to fulfil them. Nice one. Great, thanks All so right. much, Paul. Thank you. Pleasure. If you liked this video, why not subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel for all of our latest video content. Also, if you want to read the magazine, you can pick up a print copy in your local newsagent, download the tablet edition, or find us online at soundonsound.com. Thanks for watching. <laughs>